Yep, that's what's oh, happening. Oh, there we go. <laughs> You're back. You're back. You were muted. Jeremy muted my mic on purpose. <laughs> hey, welcome to Super Social Club. I'm Jeremy. This is Whiskey in the Six. I'm Rob. Welcome to the Whiskey Ramp podcast. It's a little crusty. It's frustrating. And it's going to be a little bit of a rant. I don't understand it. I don't know why. Some sort of injustice. Anyway, and rant. Hello, and welcome back to the Whiskey Ramp podcast. I'm Jeremy. I'm Rob. And tonight, we are talking about the news that shocked the world in the whiskey community recently. An article in Whiskey Advocate magazine saying that Gordon McPhail is going to cease bottling independent uh, whiskey coming very, very soon and just focus on their two distilleries that they have in production right now. Yeah, and uh, to help clarify some of the rumors and the nonsense that has been spinning around in the last week, we brought, we brought in our boy James because who knows Gordon McPhail better than James? Exactly. Um, you know, and yeah, James, yeah. welcome. Welcome to the show. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I, I've uh, heard that there's a drinking game where if you guys say our buddy James, you take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we have thanked you on many episodes recently we have. for all the uh, bottles you've provided us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know if I can do that forever, but uh <laughs> Every time you guys do like a podcast and you, you'll talk about something, you're like, oh, I wonder what like old Ben Romick. And I'm like looking at my shelf and being like, well, I've got one right there. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have been so, so generous um, for people who don't remember you. Um, you work for Authentic, Authentic or Inspirance. Inspirance and yeah, you can see a lot of my products on probably on the shelf behind me. Yeah, sure. there's, a, there's a ton of. <laughs> Gordon McPhail, Ben Romick, uh, Glen Alecky. Yeah, those are all. Yeah, those are all so, uh, rounds out your Wolfram. portfolio. You uh, you do represent um, Gordon McPhail. So uh, a fitting guest for this topic. So why don't you just tell us a quick synopsis, kind of what the deal is with uh, Gordon McPhail right now? Yeah, absolutely. As you might imagine, when that news dropped, especially the way that the Whiskey Advocate worded their their headline, like it kind of made it sound like, like they almost made it sound like Gordon McPhail is like dumping all their casks and starting from scratch. Like that's kind of was like the tagline, the way it sounded. Yeah. So um, yeah, I got a lot of messages saying like, hey, do I need to go and buy like every Gordon McPhail because <laughs> like Rob and Jeremy are going to drive the secondary price up. And uh, <laughs> But thankfully, um, the truth is, is that we are not going to see much change. Really what this means is that, um, you know, Gordon McPhail really from basically from 1895 have been kind of on this mission of promoting single malt scotch, um, you know, and specifically kind of highlighting the way that different distillate uh, works with wood in different ways. And I think historically that's looked a lot of different ways, but um, you know, we'll, we'll get into some of the detail and some of the history and, and the context of why I think they went down this road and why they're deciding not to fill from other distilleries anymore. So yeah, historically, Gordon McPhail is filled from more than 100 different distilleries. So they they're unique from other independent bottlers and in that they don't go and, you know, buy a cask of whiskey on the secondary market or on a wholesale market. They like show up at the door of the distillery with their own casks that are empty, mm -hmm. like basically get them filled from the tap and then usually either store them right on site or store them in, in their own warehouse. Would you so, say like, that Gordon McPhail, well. on on the grand scheme of things, would they be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, independent bottlers and holders of different Scotch whiskeys? It's a good question. Um, I I would think it would be Cadenheads, but I would I would okay. think they'd be right there. Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, Signatory probably has a pretty extensive collection, as does SMWS. Right. I'm sure all four of those names probably have like pretty deep, um, you know. But like the truth is, even uh, even Compass Box has like tens of thousands of casks in their warehouse from other distilleries now. So right. the uh, I you know I think the moral of the story as we get into this is that like things have changed and things are changing. And I think the whiskey business 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, it, it will look different. You know, and um, Gordon McPhail like have kind of this unique perspective that way. Like you know we think of Gordon McPhail as like stuff that's right now, which is like cool old Glen Grants and these, you know, great old sherry matured single cask McCallans that you can seemingly only get from them. And, um, you know, even 10, 20 years from now, like that's going to look very different. So do you think, is it, do you think it has anything to do with the fact that um, 
distilleries are dropping their interest in giving their product. So does that have anything to do with why Gordon McPhail got ahead of this and said, you know what? Uh, I think it's time that we stop, you know, knocking on doors and, you know, basically get ahead of it before we rely too heavily on that. And then it just kind of falls out from under us. Yeah. It kind of seems like the logical conclusion. I mean, if if you, but I, I don't think it's fully true. And the reason I say that is, is that they were still filling like dozens and dozens of distilleries, even this last year, okay. right? Like there's no shortage of distillate. You can buy distillate, even though the cost of that distillate for them is probably more than the cost it takes to produce their own distillate at Ben Romick and the Cairn, which is now, you know, fully up and running. Oh, nice. Um, so I believe actually that the amount of whiskey being distilled at the Cairn is like more than they were filling, you know, as an independent bottler. So okay. um, for sure, like... Yeah, there's a lot of these little factors, but I think, um, you know, if you if you went back in time, Rob, to like the 50s and 60s, like Gordon McPhail's business was essentially being the single malt bottler for like Glenn Livett and Glenn Grant and Mortlock and McAllen. Like their number one selling skew was the McAllen. Yeah. McAllen single malt, right? Like that's, that was their business model. So in a way, I think that, uh, like their business, like 20 or 30 years from now, actually will kind of look like more like their 1950s business where they're kind of like providing this alternative. So at the time there was like all these blends and very limited single malts available and Gore McPhail kind of like provided this like gap. And I think that's kind of what they've become in the last 20 or 30 years, which is that like, they always say that they like to release things like compliment, right? Like things, you know, maybe you get a bottle like that's in your hand of McAllen and it's, but it's different than the McAllen's you get from McAllen. Right. Or, you know, whether it's a Highland Park or a Pulteney, like their idea is always to like kind of show a different side. Yeah. Um, the, probably the most compelling argument that I heard from them when they told us this in person was that like going forward, that that need is going to become redundant. Like mm. the gap in the market of like a wide variety of interesting bottlings from distilleries that you already know that that window is going to narrow because you have all of these new products coming to market. It's true. Right. It's like, true. We are going to be very spoiled for choice. Like you can imagine walking into a shop and and thinking, you know what, do I really need, you know, from these distilleries that tend to make, you know, blended whiskey, like an alternate expression of that, which is, which is still cool, but you might also have on the shelf, all of these like great releases that will be mature from all these new distilleries that I would argue are, are making better distillate. Right. Yeah. And that's for, where Gordon McPhail might look a, a little goofy. Right. Yeah. I mean, for the, for the viewers who don't necessarily follow everything, essentially what we were talking about in previous podcasts and previous episodes is that whiskey producers in Scotland aren't necessarily selling as much or any more distillate to places like Gordon McPhail. They right. aren't, you know, selling their cast, they're keeping them for themselves and they're bottling them themselves. So, I mean, what is Gordon McPhail's official stance on this? Because like, obviously there's theories. I have a theory of, of why they're doing it, but what is their official, like, this is why we're doing it. We want to, is it just because we want to focus on our two, you know, distilleries and, and not focus on this? Like, is it a manpower issue? Is it a capital issue? What What is the official stance for them? Well, again, keep in mind that their production at the Cairn alone this year is bigger than the amount of whiskey they put in bottle as an independent bottler. So you kind of connect the dots. Really, they, you know, fast forward, they will be about Ben Romick and the Cairn. So they almost won't be unlike, you know, other small whiskey companies, just like Glenallachy or, you know, other companies that have two, three or four distilleries that they work with. And I think that they, they kind of see that um, the future for them kind of looks more like controlling their own source of distillate. And they have now a fairly wide range, right? They, I think they feel like they can make everything that they were doing historically now with what they have in front of them. Mm -hmm. And that I think, the, the value of the variety over time will go down. I think this is just a true testament to how Gordon McPhail from a very long time ago has had their finger on the pulse. Knowing yeah, exactly, honest, it does feel like 40 chess a little bit, right? Yeah, because 
because you know they start the Karen, they bought Ben Romick. What, uh, fifty? Well, how many years ago? 90, twenty early, well, 90s, almost twenty years 93. ago. Ninety three. Ninety three. It's, it's thirty years ago. 30 years. Oh, thirty years ago. Sorry, my bad. So, so thirty years ago they bought Ben Romick, very unique distillery. Mm-hmm. Starting the Karen to taste more like, uh, if I'm like, tell me if I'm wrong, but like more like a unpeated, uh, Highland kind of taste like yeah no i can terrible. describe the karen i did try the new make from the karen um and talk to some of the production team there and what they were trying to do is kind of like they did with ben romick like ben romick they were trying to create this style of space side whiskey that kind of doesn't exist anymore like something that's kind of like rustic lightly peated kind of feels a little dirty like it just has more like feel to it right um, which of course used to be more common right like even like the glen living and Blaine brands that were feeling were peated right um I think that uh, the Cairn is an effort to kind of tap into maybe the way that some of these distilleries were like kind of like pre 1970s. So, you know, distilleries like Linkwood and Glen Grant were making distillate that like had a little bit more tooth to it. Right. Um, and that matured equally well in sherry and, and American oak and really like kind of had a long-term kind of feel to it. And you can see, right. Like those, those uh, Glen Grant's, are like still plugging away like decades and decades later and same with McAllen. So yeah, I think there's a part like old school McAllen, a part old school Glen Grant, a part old school Linkwood in kind of the soul of the Cairn. That's right. And that's a benefit they have. I mean, they have samples of new make from McAllen and Linkwood and Glen Grant, like from the fifties and sixties on their premises. That's crazy. So that's, you know, that's the target. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess like one theory that I had, I mean, because I it, this came as a shock and I'm like, why wouldn't you just do it all? Why wouldn't you just continue to do everything you're doing, including production of the new distilleries? And is it like a is it a is it a wood issue? Is there a cask shortage? And it's like if we're only getting this many casks, why not use these casks as fill for our distilleries and forget about, you know, filling them up with Kalila or whatever other distillate we can get if we're not going to get distillates that are necessarily new and exciting and it's not going to appeal necessarily to the market why waste a really good cast on not our distillate why not just focus on our stuff and use the cast that we can get towards that yeah no it's a good question i i kind of thought that too um yeah in the official material like you know they sent us like a fact document and like it specifically says like look we can it's not a cask issue like we can get more casks it's yeah. that's not a problem they have good relationships at the end of the day like they are not that big you know there are distilleries that are using you know 10x the amount of casks that they're using wow. um you know they're I, now that said um you know this wasn't explicitly said to me but you know, at the same time, like adding the Karen into their production, like dramatically increases the amount of whiskey that they're putting into cask. So I'm sure that part of this, part of this, you know, the bigger kind of solution here is realizing that we don't need to like overnight double the amount of whiskey we're putting away. Right. Like that, like just from a business sense, like it just, it, it feels kind of weird to do that. Okay. Yeah. It just overnight, like instantly, like double your production. And I know the Scotch business has done that many times in the past, but again, I think, you know, Gordon McPhail has more of a long term view. And they're realizing, like, look, we can, you know, still grow our business now having these two distilleries. But then also with the stock that they have, you know, they can continue to release these awesome aged single malts from other distilleries over the next like 50 years. Yeah. Right. And as you said before, we're not really going to see a reduction in the amount of Gordon McPhail because they have stuff barreled and ready to go for the next 20 plus. Well, we'll use it up to, you know, some stuff they'll keep for 50, yeah. 60, yeah, I mean, seven this year, years, right? Like this year, they filled Morlock, they filled Linkwood, they filled Kalila from 2023, right? Like, yeah, that's, you know, we get to drink that over the rest of our lives. Um, yeah. You know, it's our kids and grandkids that maybe don't benefit. But then again, Who's to say what the whiskey landscape looks like in 40 years? And that's sure. where I think Gordon McPhail is, um, you know, I think they do look into the future and see that there's there's a lot of other whiskey coming online. There's, you know, regionality. I mean, we got, you've got shelter points behind you. Um, like things things are moving a bit, you know, and it's it mm-hmm. can't just be 1983 forever in the scotch business, even though I think there's part of us. To be honest, everyone that messaged me, that was sad about Gordon McPhail and this change. Like there was nostalgia in their tone. 
yeah which to me right away is a red flag like you know i think i think there's a cooler head prevailing idea here absolutely um, and and like you said because, because of that nostalgia really what will our kids know of that nothing right like well, they'll have lots of great whiskey in front of them exactly um, and most and um, you think about it like during this whiskey boom and gorman fails no different you know now everyone is filling their malt into great casks like that wasn't always the case yeah you know gorman fail had this niche of like interesting distillate in all like good quality casks like there's a lot of people doing that now mm -hmm. but oh. you know they can still have a niche by kind of appealing to this kind of old school scotch lover with ben romick and the and the karen for sure so in a way what they'll be offering you could argue again like i said before is more akin to what they would have been offering in the 50s 60s and 70s 20 years from now yeah no super interesting and we're very excited to try some of that stuff when it comes to age yeah, yeah that being said because you did mention mccallan being one of the major ones back then um we have a Macallan here. Yeah, this we, got, one is, we got five really nice yeah, we should, we should, right now. Yeah, we should introduce Yeah, we should go through and, and say what we're tasting. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'm happy to go first. I yeah, think actually, ahead. Jeremy, one of the questions you had was about like the relationship between filling, because it, it is kind of strange, right? It's like, why does Diageo let these guys like roll into Morlock Distillery, which isn't even open to the public, and say like, yeah, help yourself to like 50 casks full. Right. Like, we'll be fine. Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? Now, do I think that Gordon McPhail also foresees that even stuff like that could get shut off in the future? Probably. Yeah. Right. right? But again, they're ahead of the game, not behind it. Um, so on that note, the first whiskey I poured, I kind of thought that if I was on with you guys, I had to have something from Billy Walker, even though it's not Glen Alecky. So this is the Ben Riek 2005. So this would have been filled at Ben Riek um, after Billy Walker took over. And after they, I mean, they changed the distilling regime there a little bit to try to get a little bit more of a full-bodied and fruity spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one is from a refill American Hogshead at 15 years old. And I think what this speaks to is like the reputation that Gordon McPhail has and how people in the business like understand the symbiosis between what they do and how they've kind of built single malt into what it is. Because the fact that Billy Walker, like right away after he did this was like, no, 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 I want, I want some of my fluid to go to Gordon McPhail. Yeah. Like that's remarkable. Yeah. yeah, it's not intuitive, right? That's true. Yeah, Billy Walker. I mean, he knows he can do great things with whatever he has. So mm -hmm. obviously, you know, it's it's probably for him a little bit nostalgic to give Gordon McPhail uh, some liquid as well, right? And do you know if Gordon McPhail <clears throat> went over to uh, Glenallachie and got any of the newer distillate from them in the last couple of years? It's a great question. Um, a lot of that stuff, it, it's kind of the company's pretty tight lipped on. I do know that um, definitely some of the new distilleries that have popped up in the last decade are filling or or, or did fill, I guess, would be the, uh, the better tense of the verb now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Gordon McPhail has some of these new distilleries in their warehouse. Um, but of course, we won't see them for a while yet. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. Like a new distillery. I mean, obviously, Glen Alkey was established before, but if a new distillery yeah, needs, have lots of needs capital... Alkey. They yeah. have lots of Glen Alecky from pre Billy Walker in their warehouse for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, if a newer distillery needs the capital, I mean, why wouldn't they Yeah, sell some of their distillate to yeah. eager, eager hands willing to take it off the hop, especially when, when they need it. Right. Oh, yeah. I will, I will absolutely take it. So yeah, this one. Um, yeah. I think this Ben Riek, it kind of like strikes the notes in terms of kind of Gordon McPhail's like missive, which is to, you know, showcase distillate and it's kind of, natural sense but in something a little bit different right so like a single bourbon cask like this i mean it's very very rich very decadent like lots of like kind of that like almond pastry kind of notes nice but then like tons of fruit underneath what else you got over there so yeah bottle two i picked um i felt like this kind of was important to pour today so this is a highland park 1998 and this was the first cask that I picked um, after I started working for Gordon McPhail three years ago. So this was one of those moments where like I got an email saying like, hey, do you want to like bottle a whole cask for Canada? And I was like, what? <laughs> do I want to what? And then, you know, the list, the lists are kind of crazy, right? Like there's all sorts of things on the list. Um, it's not a super long list. But you kind of have to go through, and the one that stuck out to me was um, was this Highland Park 1998, and it is from a refill or a first fill bourbon barrel. So this is a little bit unusual, right? Like, have you guys ever had a 22 year old 
Highland Park from Firstville Bourbon. I think and I, I know what you're might have. about Highland Park the Light. I Maybe not. Yeah, I was going to say, like, what, what's Highland Park the Maybe Light? Maybe Because that's yeah, a 17 that's year old and it's not all ex bourbon. It's is a it? refill sherry, I think. It's a refill sherry. So, this, fortunately, at the time, I had the cast sample and I also had a bottle of the light. Yeah. And obviously, this is five years older, but this is like a turbocharged version of Highland Park the Light, which I nice. love. Yeah, that was great. So I was like, this is a no brainer. Like it's got all that like tropical fruit. It's like really fresh, like just that hint of smoke. So it's crazy yeah, what thought... happened. Sorry, I was just saying it's crazy what's happened to Highland Park because it was such a sought after bottle up until like four years ago. Yeah. And now nobody cares. Yeah, it's true. It has really well, fallen these off. These Gordon and McPhail Highland Parks, like every single oh, yeah. one that tried their lights out every single oh, one. Yeah, no, and I've had actually, uh, I think it was a 17-year-old as well, Gordon McPhail Highland Park, and that was excellent. Yeah, like some of the notes in here are just things that I find like increasingly, especially in OB, like just so hard to get. Like it's just like really, really thick, super tropical. Like, you know that like mango kind of papaya like almost like fudginess that it that you can get in those old bourbon barrels yeah and then like there's this like lovely like whiff of smoke that like makes it refreshing at the end it's 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 incredible in our experience with highland park independent bottles they've all really been way outside the distillery profile they've been way way different um isn't it rare to actually see the highland park distillery name on an independent bottle usually i know we see them just labeled as like orkney islands or whatever right like it is, it is rare. And, that, and is that a weird thing that the yeah. uh, Gordon McPhail does with Highland Park? Or? I mean, I think the time frames are so different, right? I mean, two of the Highland Parks that we brought in this year from Gordon McPhail were in 1988 and in 1984. So, you know, again, it's like the people that are in charge of Highland Park now, like, weren't even born. Right. You know, it's it's yeah. just, it's, it's with, as always with Gordon McPhail, like, wrapping your head around the time frames is, is weird because... Like I struggle with this too. Like everything in Scotch kind of started with the emergence of Compass Box, Brickladdy, Ben Riek. It's like a short list, right? When everything kind of like took off. Yeah. And uh, before that, it's like it's hazy, right? We weren't around in the '90s and the '80s, so. So you got to pick that beautiful Highland Park 22 year old, and that was what year? When when did you get to pick that? That was in uh, 2020. 2020, nice. That's nice. awesome. All right, Rob, why don't you tell them what we got here? Because you uh, you went to the archives and picked out a bunch of newer release stuff from Gordon McPhail. Yeah, I'll, I'll do this quickly because I'm not sure if James has shared all of the ones that he has. Oh, I'll just quickly share the last one. It's a bit yeah, more self-explanatory. It's a McAllen, um, 21-year-old McAllen from the year 2000. This was a cask that was bottled for British Columbia um, and was in the market. It released um, last fall in British Columbia. So the nice. 57 point one percent from a first fill oloroso sherry nice pass. so uh, before i introduce these i just because we have one as well i did have a question that i keep forgetting about and finally remembered to ask now the one that you have says uh distilled in 2000 this one says distilled in uh 2003 what is the you last got the new one yeah mm-hmm. so this is a 2022 uh distilled in 2003 oh where did you get that one from that's not a canadian bottling this one i got from in a trade i got this one in a trade okay i believe uh, that's an american bottling yeah i traded uh, i traded uh hazelburn 21 for this okay i think is that the right is that the right trade yeah, i don't know you said you traded a hazelburn 21 for something else the other podcast oh maybe it's an angel oh yeah yeah okay so what the heck did i trade for this it was a trade. I know that for sure, hundred percent. Oh, my buddy and I traded uh, Thomas H. Handy for this. A Tom, uh, okay. a Thomas H. Handy off of BTAC. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I, I mean, I was happy with that trade because I mean, it's a, it's a great, it's a great bottle. Yeah. This is uh, nineteen years old. I'm wondering when was the last cask sold from McAllen to Gordon McPhail. Like what's what's the most recent date we're gonna see? Yeah, I think the distillate cuts off at 2008. Oh wow. Okay. So we have a few more years. Yeah, but not not forever. <laughs> no, it's, it's like not, I, well it seems like years. yeah and they're only releasing these really at like 19, 20, 21, right? So 
Yeah. I think, no, you said there's going to, I there's... think that they'll hold on to some of these for like 40, 50, 60 years. And maybe like, I don't know, sell them to Edrington for like obscene amounts of money. Probably. Yeah, why not? Who knows? Why not? It's a good business plan. It's worked before. <laughs> it's worked. <Yeah. laughs> it seems to have worked before. We don't know. We, I, let you know, I was trying to tell them like, they need to, uh, they need to get like a third distillery by like trading old Glenlivet casts for like, <laughs> I don't know, like Strap Isla distillery or something. Yeah. Just straight casts for distilleries. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I do. I do pick up a hint of sulfur in this one that I've not picked up on any of the other spay malts that I've had. No, they tend to be very clean. That's yeah. something I've noticed. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a hint in this one, but it's not bad. It was it's a not touch like... in the 55.5, but it kind of came across more almost like an earthiness. Yeah, that 55.5 blew me away. I yeah. thought that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, even the one, we only had a sample of it from when the tasting that you gave us in the, like a care package in our hotels. I can't remember what year yeah, that, that one that was. was the 1999 to 2020, 21 year old. So that, that was, was the first one we released here. And that one, um, that one was, it reminded me of um, Tootsie Rolls. Like yeah. it had the kind of like malted chocolate flavor. Yeah, and I would say good. this, um, the one that I have here, the one that from BC this last year is um, it's like very, very like sweet and caramelized. Nice. Yeah. Like it almost has that like kind of like vanilla latte with too many pumps. In nice. It, type of flavor. Yeah. Yeah. The, the epitome of, the white chick drink. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that a bad thing to say? I don't know. I'm white. So no, someone's like, gonna yeah. someone that listens to the podcast is gonna be in line at Starbucks behind you, Rob, and be like, Hey, did you just order a like three pump vanilla latte? <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, you know, it's weird. Like we don't really run into I don't really run in I, like very rarely have run into whiskey people. Actually, I was in a mall with my son and a guy from Iran ran up to me in and he's like you are on youtube <laughs> i'm like what is happening That's amazing. I think full accent and he knew exactly who i was and it was hilarious because people that live here have no idea who i am <laughs> no no you think that you would maybe see someone in the in the whiskey aisle at the lcbo and be like oh i think people see us they just like yeah i'm not saying hi to that guy <laughs> <laughs> the only time i ever got approached was at like uh, uh spirit of toronto yeah spirit yeah. of toronto yeah because we told people we we're going there and like come say hi to us at spirit of toronto true and one person did yeah i was i was in line once at a whiskey release like trying to get something just personal and uh someone said hey you're that whiskey guy and i was like i kind of remember thinking like for those of us that work in the whiskey business if you're recognized in public like what that's our business isn't big enough to merit that type of recognition it's true it's very niche it's very niche so what are the other uh, connoisseurs choice bottlings that you so, that you have lined up there i actually have a link read them from a distance yeah so i have a linkwood over my shoulder the 15 but i don't know if it would have done well against all these cast strength whiskeys so we decided to leave it offset um first fill daluin i i probably butchered the way that's pronounced but uh no, that's right. yeah that's okay yeah. 13 year old 59.4 percent it's uh first fill sherry which, so. yeah that stuff drinks well at 59 percent, which is shocking yeah it's it's super like there's some sherry casts that are very caramel forward this is one of them mm -hmm. this one is one we talked about before it's a 23 year old kulila uh 1997 distillate first fill sherry this is amazing yeah, yeah is that I mean, bottle for really canada probably or... the very best bottlings we've brought in in the last few years is that was that exclusive to Canada? That one is exclusive to North America, but I will say that uh, I was greedy with that one. Um, truthfully, I mean it's a big cask. How many bottles does it say? Um, four hundred and sixty-nine bottles. Wow. Yeah, it. Um, I bet you we brought two hundred and fifty of those into Canada. Nice. Yeah, this one so is the great. Rest went to the U.S. And um, like fifty nine point nine percent sherry, twenty year old yeah. Isla whiskeys. You just don't. So no, no, and and that the price was really good as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, these two are from Kensington Wine Market, which we've sung praises to for many years for their picks. Yeah, for their picks. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a Klein Leash fourteen year old, I believe. Thirteen year old, I lied. Um, two thousand. 
seven, fifty six point five percent. Really like that one. It was good. And this one is even better. Yeah, this it, one is I haven't I mean I've drank the most out of that so far tonight. I don't know what's happening. Ever since our little blend uh blend again or whatever the hell you want to call it, <laughs> I've been like just pouring bourbon cask whiskeys lately. Yeah. Uh In bourbon the summer, cask it, it appeals scotch. more. It just does. Right? I think so. Yeah. And this Glen Scotia, 22-year-old, 56.9%, bottled in 2000. A Kensington wine market pick. And honestly, Andrew got lucky with this one. Yeah. He got super lucky. The tropical fruit notes on the finish of this are just bursting on the palate. It's it's crazy. It's, Did it's, you guys notice it really needs time to open up a lot? It, do, it, it does. Both and, of his last casts were like that. Yeah, you can't tell by the fill levels of my bottles anymore, but... These have been open for a while. I'm surprised you haven't taken more out of this one. But like, look over my shoulder. I mean, like, you what? have lots to choose from, but yeah, but it's it's not like there's not very much that's at a low fill level here, unless it's been here for almost like a year and a half to two years. Yeah. So it's just it is what it is. But this Glen Scotia is probably, arguably, my favorite on the on the table right now. Yep. So so, good. which is crazy yeah. because I yeah, love the that. that I'm that I'm trying is has a lot of similarities in terms of that like building tropical fruit on the back end. Mm. Yeah, I could totally see that. Um, yeah, one of the one of the joys that you know comes along with this job is working with, especially retailers like picking casks because there is something kind of personal to that. And I mean, thankfully, like that will obviously continue with Ben Romick and the Cairn, um, and you know they have lots of interesting stuff, but. Uh, you know, arguably it might be better um, long term, but, you know, kind of getting, getting to kind of, you know, look at these different distilleries. And sometimes you might think like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, take a Tormor single cask. And then you try it. And, you know, there was a co-op Tormor single cask a couple of years ago that just like, imagine that tropical fruit, but like turned up to like level 10. Like really? it was just, it was insane. Yeah. So, and you know, like there's, there's a constant stream of them. Like just even now, like, um, like wine and beyond in Alberta have, as a 12 year old Royal Brackla and a 12 year old Altmore coming in. Oh, nice. Um, BSW has this lovely 17 year old Scapa that has lots of melon, like ripe cantaloupe kind of flavors to it. Oh, wow. um, cool. And a really cool, like 26 year old um, Glen Berge from a, from a refill bourbon barrel. That's just like super aromatic and just delicate. Hmm. Is that like, coming in these, one like, of these? There's so much variety. Will that be coming in one of these shapes or what yeah. the fatter, like stubbier bottles? No, it's... That shape. Yeah, and of course, Kensington Wine Market has like a Bladnock 1988 in that more stubby, fatter bottle. Yeah. It's like a cast that only had 70 bottles, so that's why they took the whole thing. But um, like, it's just, you know, it's fun to do that work and like kind of go through the process. And, you know, it's amazing. Like sometimes people have even said no to a cask and then someone else has said yes. And like, it's kind of cool, that dynamic. And I think like we all naturally, I, I know you guys for sure have thought this, like if you could like go into like the warehouse at Springbank and you'd find like this perfect honey barrel. But the truth is, is that like cast selection process isn't really like that. Yeah. Like it, it's not so clearly defined. There's a lot of uh, unique factors. And um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, like the professionals that are like in the lab selecting usually really are better at it. I think that's like a lesson I've picked up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think many distilleries will let you walk in and say, Hey, let me try everything. And then, <laughs> and then pick a bottle. Well, and even then, well, that, like, believe it or not, that happened to me at Ben Riek and I actually was able to pick a cask and bottle it, but that's like super unusual. That's pretty cool. That's a really cool experience. The problem with that experience is at what point are you like, are you blowing your palate? Like at what point are you like, okay, yeah. I've had, 17 cast strength whiskeys yeah. and okay maybe they're a sip or two but it's like i don't know man like I, I, maybe that one was the best maybe this well, it's one funny you say that the cask that i picked that, that time at ben Rhea years ago was um it was a 1998 tawny port and at the time i remember thinking like wow this is like so luscious like there's just so much going on here like i need to bottle this and a lot of the feedback that people gave me when it came, it was, it actually kind of like, it was tough to hear some of the feedback because people were saying like, this cask has gone over a little bit, you know, it's a cigar dram. And I know lots of people love that. And there was a lot of people that had good feedback, yeah. but um, I think the point was that like, yeah, I'd been tasting a lot and this is 10 years ago. Right. And I think my pal was a bit tired. And yeah. I think that's part of the process, you know, but that's it's why you say that. Cask. 
the professionals. But in my the mind, best, it right? was like the best cask. And that's yeah. just, that's kind of not like how the process actually unfolds in real time. Yeah, because when you line up, like we're not, like when you line up five whiskeys like this and they're all cast strength and they're all different in their own way. Are you tasting this Macallan the way it's meant to be tasted on its own uh, after following it up with, you know, or after having it followed by like whatever, you know what I mean? Whatever order you drink it in it, like by the time you get back to that Macallan, it's not going to taste the same. It's tasting good to me. I'll tell you It's that. very good. It's very <laughs> so good. good. But, and they're all very good. You know what I mean? But I'll it's address just... that specifically. I think there's a, you guys answered that really well on the last podcast when you talked about how Ben Romick like the 10 and the 15 and the 21 at 43%. It's like, we all kind of have this thought of like, man, like those would be better if they were 46. That's probably true. But we all like, if we're being honest, have times where it's like you reach in and you're like, you know what? This 43 is like exactly what I need. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely. That's exactly you know, right. And like, like I, I would kind of be sad if that was gone. It's true. And I mean, my issue, and I, I would have such a hard time being even if I had a week to pick a cask and they're like, you know what, start row by row and then write down your notes and decide from there and narrow like narrow it down. Even it in a week, I don't think I could do a good job because I feel like there you need to try a whiskey like four different ways. You need to have it right out of the barrel at cast strength barrel proof, you know, and then you need to water it down to yes. Like watering it down is crucial, right? Yeah, you gotta water it down to 50. You gotta water it down to you know, yeah, for sure. And and you're not gonna you need to go through that that process for each of the whiskeys because there could be a point where it's Mm off-putting, right? And like I remember a linkwood that I bought a long time ago, and at at cast strength, it wasn't it wasn't my favorite, it was like maybe a you know an 85 but then when you added water to that liquid it was like a 92 and it was a significant difference i've never had such a significant significant difference in a whiskey in my life but that was one that really stuck out to me because i was like how many times did i go through an entire bottle didn't play with it at all as far as water goes and it could have been way way better if i did no. or it could you know been way worse and i know i don't have to add water well, or whatever but sure. yeah that says a lot to cast picks because you know if if you open a bottle of benromic 15 like that first sip you kind of are like 90% into your opinion of it and your experience but like that glen scotia like that's a bottle that you drink over many months and like right. it slowly unfurls and your opinion of it you're right like goes through phases Like you're going to love it and hate it on different nights. And, you know, the person who chose that, like might've been really convinced, but I think over time, like the excitement you get over one one cast versus another, or one bottle being great or another, it kind of tempers a little bit. There's nights where I come down here because my wife doesn't want to come down to the basement some nights to watch a movie or whatever, because it's too cold down here, apparently. So (laughs) we have to stay on, on the main floor to watch a movie some nights. So I'll come down here to pick my one dram because I'm not going to go back and forth and whatever. Right. It's like, it's like picking from Netflix yeah. over here. Yeah. And like, I'm like, how do I know I'm going to like that whiskey tonight? <laughs> like, what if I don't like that? I get up there. I don't like that whiskey. I got to come back. Like, yeah. It's a nightmare. That's happened to me too, where I'm like, <clears throat> there's so much good stuff to choose from. And then I pour it and I'm like, take one sip. I'm like, nah. I want something different. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it yeah. is hard to pick. No, it's hard. It, uh, uh, a big part of the whiskey journey is learning over time, like what you think the type of whiskey drinker you are, and then what you actually become and what you actually do in practice is two different things. Yeah. Right. Like when you start, I'm sure you guys were the same. It's like you want to buy one of everything because you want to like educate and you kind of do need to taste everything. Like you need to hammer and forge out your palate. And then you get to a point, like, I, I feel like this, like when I tend to drink whiskey it tends to be kind of later at night, like after dinner, I'm like watching a show or like, I don't know, doing whatever. Yeah. And I I usually want something that's like at least somewhat special in those moments. And I tend to not drink a ton. So, you know, having like a whole bunch of like 12 and 15 year old OB bottles is like a real waste on my shelf. But there was a time where that was like all I wanted to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like you go through those different phases. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It is true. Speaking of phases, um, what do you think the industry is 
thinking about this Gordon McPhail decision? Is there going to be ripples through here? Are other independent ballers being like, oh, they're making these decisions, so we do the same? Or are other distilleries like more for us? If Gordon McPhail's not, you know, filling, yeah. then we can maybe take their spot. There's, I think there's some unanswered questions that, let's say if, if you're someone who buys, not fill, but like casks. So, you know, if you're a signatory SMWS, um, you can see that like different people are kind of taking different approaches. Like I would argue that SMWS is rebranded themselves as someone who also bottles like world whiskeys. And I think that that actually will pay off for them because like long-term, the truth is, is that there will be great mature casts of Shelter Point and these Australian distilleries and German and Danish distilleries. And like SMWS can bottle those under their own brand and like they'll, they'll be safe, you know, yeah. like they right. don't just need to yep. bottle like old spring banks to like keep their business going. Um, I, my guess, I mean, it's tough to know what everyone's thoughts are. I mean, everyone knows that at some point, like the crazy demand, you know, it will peak and start to fall off at some point. Um, I think that that doesn't mean that like people are going to stop drinking scotch, but it does mean that the availability of casks again might kind of come around a, a little bit. So, you know, my guess is if you're a company that has deep stocks like Caden Heads or, or um, uh, yeah, maybe, I, I don't know, Signatory, like the the Langs, um, you know, maybe they just kind of feel like, you know what, we can wait around and like good whiskey will come back on the market. Mm hmm and, um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's tough to predict. I mean, who knows where the whiskey business is in 10 years. So, right. you know, if, if you can get to that point and, you know, most of those companies, they all have their own distilleries now too, right? They've all, that's true. They've all gone out and either bought or built their own distilleries. So they, they've hedged their investment portfolio a little yep. bit more. Yeah. And Gordon McPhail's no different. I'm going to sidebar here for a second because I know my voice is getting extra froggy and like hoarse at the moment. And there was a comment made. So to like temper concerns about my health, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of singing lately and I'm also a teacher and like the number one and two occupations where people tend to have a more hoarse voice is singer and teacher. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. What's, what's number three, Rob? I Whiskey don't know breaker. what number three is. <laughs> I don't know what number three is, but I also the oldest profession ever. Oh, well, that that's uh, you would know more about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the other thing I noticed I do too is like when I'm teaching kickboxing, like I don't know if you've ever like watched karate or any of that kind uh, of stuff. You say a lot of haya. But they, well, it's not haya, <laughs> but like you do, like especially Thai boxing. There's like you know you 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 yeah something like that, right? So. I'm like, I do everything that's terrible for my voice, including the drinking after, because now we're drinking like five cast strength whiskeys after sure. just giving my vocal cords a beating for like, you know, and then yelling at my kids too. Let's not forget about that. That's so. true. You do you <laughs> punish yourself and then you reward yourself with 60% poison. Yeah. <laughs> right down to, the go and have like an Aaron Rodgers weekend where you like, you know, do some sort of weird psychedelic drug in absolute silence and darkness for a weekend. I need to do that. I need to, honestly, I'm, I'm looking, I've been doing a lot of research on like psilocybin and stuff like that. And I really need to try shrooms. I really do. <laughs> it's going to happen. Like I, I'm, I'm, it's kind of like gray area legal now. Like it's not necessarily illegal. I think you can legally buy them. Yeah. You can yeah, legally buy in them. Vancouver, you can legally buy it. Yeah. You can yeah. In Vancouver, you can legally buy anything now like i think heroin is free is legal now in, in vancouver i think but um I, I don't doubt it no i think that's true isn't it no not heroin i mean you can't just like you can't just like go into a thing and be like heroin please and they just sell it to you that's no not how i feel like that's how this is where you're gonna fact how. check and there it no. was uh there was in fact a place jeremy that that had that boom no you have to be part yeah. it's like jeremy they had a sandwich program board you had a sandwich board on the sidewalk. You can't yeah, just... so there's 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 like um, places in Vancouver because of the amount of people on like hooked on on heroin and stuff like that, where you can go and like they administer it to you cleanly so that you don't you know, right? I think am I correct on saying that? I think so, right? Yeah, we're we're in well over our head now. 
Yeah. We've said too much. Yeah. Well, why, why are we? I don't know. Anyway, psilocybin is anyway, cool. Do heroin. Yeah. Drugs are bad. Don't do, do drugs. Do everything. Yeah. yeah. Drugs are bad. I'm not going to do heroin. <laughs> I'll never do a hard drug in my life. But uh, yeah, there's, there's, I, mean, I might try some psilocybin at some point. But Aaron Rodgers <laughs> does the craziest things. Like he will do that weird, like, you know, cactus extract that, like, it puts you into like a crazy state where you like shit yourself and puke yourself for like three days straight and then you're high for four days straight ayahuasca stuff yeah something like that okay but that's he does like bloodletting he's he does a lot of crazy shit. he's a weird dude he does a lot of crazy shit he's a weird dude he's a weird dude if he had um, gone into distilling though he'd be worshipped because like those those are always the crazy guys that like turn into icons right like yeah, you, you gotta weird, have that weird edge to you. Shaman guy. That's kind of every every the, like, um, industry. The arts. Yeah, I remember when we met with uh, Compass Box. One of the things, you know, they have a lot of. There's been some changes there, and there's some a lot of new staff, and you know, it was weird because I think like I had worked with the brand the longest of anyone at the table because I've been around kind of for like 12 years with the brand, and uh, you know, they were kind of asking me like, you know, what are the types of things that like Compass Box could do, and like the first thing that came to mind was like. You know, I, I always think of like John Glazer as kind of being almost like the Anthony Bourdain of whiskey. Like, mm. you know, he was kind of like our captain a little bit for those of us that like got in in the last 20 years. Like, you know, like he needs to be in. And I actually I actually told him, I'm like, he needs to be more truculent, as Brian Burke would say, you know, yeah. like, like <laughs> you need that personality. You need that's that's what works in the whiskey business. Right. That's a, a lot of the um, the charisma that's come with scotch. Now, Gordon McPhail hasn't really gone down this road, but there's been a lot of personalities that, you know, because of that character, have put brands on their back and kind of built a following based on that. I'm a strong believer in people like sharing the same wavelength. And I know that that sounds like mystical and crazy, but I was watching uh, and my wife likes to watch our, our wedding video on uh, our anniversary. And it was our 12th year anniversary the other day, Here believe it or not. Nice. Wow. Crazy. Congrats. Uh, yeah. Thanks. And we were, <laughs> we were listening to it. And uh, in my speech, I bring up Brian Burke and I talk about <laughs> truculence and wow. like the, the fact that you brought that up tonight, <laughs> which I think I haven't heard that since like Brian Burke was the GM of the Leafs. Right. I don't know. Does he even use that terminology anymore? That's probably not a real word um who <laughs> who in the whiskey business would you say strikes you as being truculent other who than in the, uh, uh what's his name from brook laddie well, yeah, I mean, left jimmy Brooke McEwen, obviously jimmy McEwen, yeah yeah jimmy McEwen, yeah. yeah yeah um who else that's a good question yeah from that like older generation i feel like there was quite a lot i think you know who... tate from uh from jura the old master distiller of jura was a lot like that um, I would argue that um, uh, who was the master distiller at um, Ardbeg and Glenmo? Um, he's doctor still there. Something. Doctor, doctor. Uh, yeah. Who am I drawing a blank? I'm drawing a blank as well. Whiskey green. I'll put it on the screen. Yep. Yeah, well, Jeremy, I'll throw it up there. Uh, yeah, you know, and everyone will be like, "These guys are total idiots." For <laughs> most famous guy, and in... yeah, he's up there. <laughs> you know who is who has a good. You could tell there's a big set on him and is not afraid to take chances. Is uh, the owner and master distiller of Macalones? Oh, yes, yeah, he would be he's truculent. That's yes. yeah, Graham. Yeah. yeah, you could tell Graham, right? Graham, yeah, yeah. yeah. great dude, yeah. great dude, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch out there, yeah. What okay, so. I know this is hard because like picking your children, who is your favorite? You you might have one, you might not, but it's hard to say it out loud. But what would be the your favorite Gordon McPhail bottling in the last five years? Yeah, this is a good question. I think it raises an even bigger question, which is that, you know, like how we learn to love whiskey is by, again, like, you know, by trying all these different things. And like Gordon McPhail kind of opens this door where you suddenly get to have like this wider breadth of, of intake of like context where you kind of feel like, okay, like I now have a greater sense of what Highland Park is. And if like what I like about it, what I don't, that I wouldn't have gotten just by trying the obese. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in essence, like going along for the journey with Gordon McPhail over a period of time and like tasting different expressions, like clearly gives you this kind of like wider stance on 
you know, the Scotch world at large. It just does. It, it expands your palate and it gives you perspective on things that you wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, and, you know, obviously independent bottlers in general, like, you know, the the bulk of trying them all and trying different distillers and different ones. So, you know, that does kind of tie back into why Gordon McPhail might realize like that ability to do that is being filled in other ways now, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. But um, yeah, if, I mean, I probably would, if I could like go into their warehouse and like, you know, really get into some cool stuff, like I, I probably would be very tempted to start at the Highland Park section. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, that would, I would love to yeah, try like just, an older Gordon I, McPhail Highland Park. Yeah, though. and no, they're all amazing. Like the ones, all the ones from the 80s that I've tried, I've never tried anything older than that, but I've tried three or four different 80s ones and they've all been just like, they just check every box for me and this um, is like where I'd start and it's personal because of this cast that I picked of course too. yeah yeah I think this happens to me a lot recently where we've been forgetting a lot of the stuff that we've tried and I'm <laughs> pretty certain Jasper has poured us a Gordon McPhail Highland Park 30 year old does that make sense to you oh yeah so the the distillery labels range right like you guys know what I'm talking about well McCallum is essentially one of those but like things like this, right? So this is like an example of a current one nice. where like there was a period of time, like we were talking about this earlier, where like Gordon McPhail was essentially the place where you'd go to get like Glen Grand Single Malt, McAllen Single Malt. And of course, I had this older bottle, Glen Livet. Yeah. Right. So if you wanted to go and get a Glen Livet Single Malt, this is where you got it from. Was you didn't go to the Glen Livet or the Glen Livet's distributor, which is like whatever Corby's. Like you would go to Gordon McPhail. Yeah. So that was true of other brands too, like Highland Park, Pulteney, that you just don't see anymore. True. So yeah, yeah that Highland Park 30 probably was essentially was uh, part of a range like that. Yeah, it was 30, 30 or 31. It happened. Well, no, I'm yeah. not imagining the truth this. with yeah, Gordon McPhail too. If you're really going to get like into your absolute favorites, like there is some cookies deep in that cookie jar that are just... Yeah, like, you know, we tried a few years ago a Glenn Vore 1966 sample. Like, yeah. you know, that was like out of this world. It was like nothing I've ever tasted. So, well, you know, they yeah. have stuff like that back there, but obviously those are the unicorns. I feel like including the ones that we got to try, thanks to you and Richard, are not even fair. Like the one that the we Glenn tried the other day. 80, the, Glenn, the Glenn Grand 70. The Glenn Grand 70. Yeah. The Glenn Grand. yeah, you take it for granted almost instantaneously, right? Yeah, like you have this taste experience where you're like, oh my gosh, like I didn't even know that was possible right. with, yeah. with this hobby. No, and exactly. You kind of we like didn't... have to like shift gears back into like doing the normal stuff and getting excited about it, and like you almost have to compartmentalize that memory because it's like it's almost not even real. And to think, if I didn't have that Glen Alecky ten year old batch five, I think it was never it batch have happened. It yeah. might not have happened. <laughs> I think if you go back Thank to like the bottles, yeah, the bottles like if you've owned or I've owned, I mean that Mortlock eighty seven stood out for us. Oh yeah, that was a huge one. That was unreal. Really, that, really good. still one of my favorite of all time. Everything you see on the table in front of you right now is amazing. Very good. the The fifty five point five still sticks out for me Same a lot. McAllen, oh, yep. yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I feel like one of the benefits we've had at Gordon McPhail is like the, the team and what they're selecting and bottling right now. Like they're they're doing a good job. Yeah. There, there's not a lot of stuff squeaking past the gates that's like second tier. You, you know what I love most about Gordon McPhail is you you see McAllen coming out with these incredible whiskeys. And like there are some really incredible whiskeys that McAllen comes out with. And they don't care to share that with like people like us. They don't care to share that with the guys that would truly appreciate hmm. those whiskeys. They don't give a shit. But I'm trying. I, I wish like I had more McSpay malt. And I mean, you guys probably see, like, I've got the Billy Walker four year old up there. Like, I wish I could share those even more. But. No, but you've you've been so incredibly generous with us. And like, guys, even like Richard, like the guy sitting at a table with oh, us. He's so generous at a restaurant in Toronto, and he's like giddy about like. Passing us a, a bottle of like a 60 year old Gordon McPhail. Well, how old was that? 70. 70 year old, my Glenn bad. Grant. Glenn Grant, Gordon McPhail. And he's like, Yeah, pour it yourself. And I pour myself some. And you can see in the video, I look up and he's like, Pour more. He's like, What are you doing? I'm like, like, uh, I'm like I can't pour more. <laughs> he's like, No, no, you 
Four more. Not worthy of pouring more. So, yeah, no, and, and like it's just like unbelievable. Oh, I love Richard. Generosity. Yeah, I know. It's it's I still yeah, you have to kind of pinch yourself. <laughs> right? Seriously though. We're always like super like envious of his position because he gets to like, go around and share whiskey that like his grandparents like bottled or barreled like so long ago right like i just you know i i find that really hard to be envious of like a guy that's just doing it right you know what i mean like he, i'm just so happy yeah. for him like it's just like it's yeah. like wow yeah, it like, does this... seem like they could have squandered this they right. absolutely could have like yeah. that's what we shouldn't take for granted and they like even the fact that they built the systems in their family to kind of like protect the business and like you know, like the CEO that is leaving early next year, Ewan, like I met him, he's like just a brilliant, inspirational guy. Like, and you know, they just all work together. It's, it, it seems like the company is just in a good place. So James, concluding on this Gordon McPhail announcement, because like it did take a lot of people, you know, kind of by storm. And I think that we felt like, oh man, like that's too bad because we really like Gordon McPhail's products. And I don't think we've ever had a bad one. Even their younger, more inexpensive stuff was always great. Where is the industry heading with independent bottlers? Like, do you see it still being really relevant and continuing to be strong for like the whiskey enthusiast person who wants to venture out beyond, you know, the official bottlings and find stuff that's more niche and more different? Or are we going? Yeah, I I think it looks a little bit different. I think that like, look at how the SMWS has evolved as a brand, right? They used to be one independent bottler in kind of this group of independent bottlers. I think you're going to start to see more different independent bottlers. Like, would you say that Signatory and SMWS are like fit in the same category anymore? I kind of wouldn't. And and to take that a step further, would you say that Lost Lantern and Gordon McPhail are in the same category? Like they're doing such different things. Yeah. And that that divergence is going to continue. So like Caden Heads might truly become, you know, especially with like they sell a lot of product on their website now. Like they could be a company that has these three retail shops and then sells releases online. And that could be their business model, you know? And then likewise, like Gordon McPhail could be the company that has a seeming endless supply of like 30 and 40 and 50 year old whiskey. When we're like telling our grandkids like, Oh, you should remember like right. when Gordon McPhail had these 80 year old Glen Livets and it'll be like, you know, things, things will shift. Um, yeah. The, uh, the amount of of options is just going to keep going up like just look at the craft beer world just look at the wine world and that's that's your preview yeah. um you know someone made the analysis i i can't remember who i heard this from but that you know basically you think of the wine world like it used to be just like kind of like france and italy right and then all of a sudden you had these like new upstarts from like australia and california and south america and people were like you know the french and the the italians kind of like shrugged them off and then there's that big judgment of paris where like the California wines beat the French wines and they kind of like were basically caught with their pants down. And, but, you know, fast forward 20 years from that or 30 years from that and everybody won, like there was room for everything. And I think, I think that's the journey whiskey's going on. I think that we have all the pieces in place now, like there is shelter points. There is these distilleries in Europe. There is distilleries now in, in England um, and like all these like dozens of new distilleries in Ireland like you're going to have much more regionality. You're going to have much more. Like I could, I could first see where like, you know, heaven forbid the LCBO ever privatizes and you guys have decent whiskey shops there. <laughs> like you could have a totally separate, awesome whiskey shop that had a completely separate, totally awesome whiskey shop in Victoria. Like that's where I think we're going. Yeah. Where it's like the way it's been the last 20 or 30 years, it's like, you know, everyone has McAllen 12 and, you know, it's, it's, there's kind of been a little bit of a predictability to it. I think that's going away. I think you're going to have a lot more diversity. Yeah. I always, I always had that dream about owning like a whiskey shop, but then I realized that I'm so biased towards like single malt that like, you couldn't stock it. I couldn't do it for what people wanted. The other day, you I, don't I don't apologize for that. people like Cabernet Sauvignon and wine too. It's not going I away. I know, but so the other day I posted a, <laughs> um a little reel on instagram of a of an octopus like hiding in a a clamshell i don't know if you saw that no. did you see it no. so it's an octopus it's a 
It says <laughs> bourbon guy, all scotch tastes the same. Yeah. Me, and then this octopus like <laughs> closing a, a clamshell. Right. It's like hiding from hiding from this guy. And like I just I don't know. I can't get around some of the logic that is and I hear it so often, and it's more often than I hear people knowing about single mall. And I don't think there's very many people that listen to our podcast that don't know, you know, they know as much as we know about single mall. So they're mm-hmm. That's why they're listening, and you know it's just funny. I don't. I, I, it would be very tough to, like, sell anything above a certain price range in bourbon. Yeah, for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I feel you on that. Would you, you pay? Pick... Would you pay three hundred dollars for Mictor's ten? No. That's the so price I can't. I can't do it, and I like it, and I. I really do actually. I think it's one of the better bourbons but the problem with paying three hundred dollars for Mictor's 10 is i know that there's a 300 hundred dollar bottle of scotch that i would way prefer i would say yeah. any of these right yeah are these all under 300 bucks um almost all of them ex- for the spay malt, spay malt and the more. the kalila i believe was close to 400 was it not uh you could probably get it for 350 yeah there okay, you go so there you go so these out these will out drink that bourbon any day of the week all of them yeah Oh, at least for the three of us yeah but for us and that's the thing right like, no, I, I understand gotta be, for the bourbon drinker you know, i do i, I try there. to be careful because i get it like taste is yeah, i get it too objective you know what i mean i try to i try to be careful and i get it and i don't want to sound ignorant by saying this is better but we've been we've tried we've tried like the top of the top when it comes to bourbon yeah and we haven't <laughs> come close to trying to top the top when it comes to scotch. And, we haven't, no. and we've tried what we've tried, and we still would say it blows bourbon away. It annihilates. Well, maybe the way to wrap this up is to think about, you know, taking this back to Gordon McPhail. And, you know, they were faced with this dilemma very recently, right? When they released the Glenlivet 80 year old. And, you know, they released it at 80,000 pounds. Like they had never done anything like that before. But at the end of the day, like you kind of, even for them, they kind of had to go outside their bubble and realize like, yeah, it's not, I don't think they were really comfortable to be honest. Like, yes, it's easy to say like, oh yeah, they made lots of money off that. But it's like, I don't think deep down they were truly comfortable with that. But at the end of the day, you're right. Like for someone, you know, when I, I was there in person when the name was drawn to win the 80 year old in Vancouver, I don't know if I've ever seen someone that excited in my life. Like. The, the woman that won it, she she told me, I said, uh, like, I talked to her and I said, like, why was it so special to you? And she's like, I grew up with nothing. My family doesn't have heirlooms. We don't have a story. She's like, this is a real thing that I now own. And like, she was emotional. For and sure. I was like, you know what? I don't think about whiskey that way. But like, that doesn't mean that someone can't. And that, yeah. that doesn't actually have that value. So absolutely you know, like, for them. She- she potentially picks something up that could be worth a million dollars one day. There you go. Right. But more like, importantly, she goes to sleep at night and knows that there's something that is like completely unique that she was a part of. Yeah. You know, and absolutely. That actually has real value to her, but yeah, probably someone will sell for a million dollars. Right. Someone's going to sell it for a million. <laughs> exactly, for sure. It, it, but it, I mean, it is like winning the lottery when you win a bottle like that. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. a, it's an incredible investment because you know, the moment you walk out of the store with that bottle, it's already doubled. Yeah, hopefully she just won't toss it 30 feet in the air and try to catch it. <laughs> we were actually joking about that in Toronto. <laughs> I was yeah. th- I was Richard was like, Yeah, they didn't like that. I'm like, Yeah, no shit, they didn't like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you could tie Richard to a uh lie detector, I think he thought that was clever. But yeah. I, I don't I'm not sure the crystal glass blowers. We're, sure. we're so convinced yeah yeah that was <laughs> if hilarious, you like though. spend an entire day of your life like hand blowing that decanter <laughs> you might have a dartboard with mike breeze blast yeah head on it you're like who is this fucking guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah we haven't All talked right. about that much on this channel uh, if you're unfamiliar i'll throw the picture up here um and try that 80 year old yeah i mean it's really one of the all-time pictures in whiskey period like it just i could see that yeah he, oh man <laughs> and that's, it didn't, it like we should like photographer taking the photo yeah yeah we should we should say that you know it didn't have the whiskey inside true it was a mock whiskey yeah real bottle 
real bottle yeah. real bottle that they used to bottle the 80 year old but not the actual whiskey <laughs> still crazy so end of the day gordon mcphail is not going anywhere for a very long time there's still going to be bottling lots time. of great stuff the independent bottling market is not in disarray there's still going to be lots of good independent bottlings out there um, but maybe just not the range of distilleries that we're used to seeing would you yeah. say that's fair yeah, there is there is more whiskey and casks right now globally than there has ever been in history. We will be fine. Right. Yeah. So maybe some new distilleries in the independent bottling market, but the old the old giants, the old the old ones, maybe not so much anymore. No, they're getting greedy. They want to keep it. They want to keep it for themselves, which makes sense, I think, as well. It's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. James, it's been a pleasure as always. Thanks for um, having me. Thanks so much for joining us and giving us so much insight into uh, into the industry. Yeah, we we are always. Um, uh, privilege to have you on this podcast and i'm running out of whole bottlings though guys i can't promise <laughs> what did we reference that you might have before like an old uh glen alki 30 30 batch oh, yeah, one like, <laughs> like maybe james has a glen alki 30 batch one oh, i wish i have no 21s or 30s guys I'm sorry those are even for me that's a tough one yeah no i, I probably should have made it happen but oh well <laughs> it's all good man you've you've been more There's than enough other cool stuff Far too generous. So. I'll be honest. I, sure. as a final note, I I like the Billy Walker four year old better than the yeah. thirty. That's just there you me. go. Really? Yeah. That's that's a big. So, can you tell us if there's older whiskey inside? <laughs> let's uh, let's end the podcast here, and then when we go offline, I'll tell you guys some of the secrets of that stuff. Beautiful. Uh, okay. I like that. I think for the price, you can definitely assume that there's more than just four year old. Yeah, Billy Walker doesn't mess around. <laughs> let's let's be honest. He's not ripping anybody off. That guy knows what he's doing. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Much appreciated. Give us a comment, throw down a like. Um, Gordon McPhail, what do you think about this news? Leave us a comment down below. Um, and until next time, guys, we will talk to you then. Salute. Cheers. So first of all, this is this is a hundred percent dis four year old distilled by Billy Walker. Oh wow! So this is from like the first run of peated that they did. Sorry, um, there's nothing there's nothing older in there than four. No, well there can't be. There was no peated whiskey before this first distillation, right? They only started distilling in 2018. What's the PPM on yeah, that? Yeah, we can just blend some new peated stuff with like a bunch of old stuff. Kind of like he did with McNair's. But that's that's what McNair's is. Yeah. But he so, didn't do it in this? No. To, to be honest, I um this is gonna sound crazy. I genuinely believe that five years from now, when you say Glen Alecky, you're gonna think heated scotch, not sherry scotch. That's crazy. That's scary to me actually, because I love it. Yeah, it is. Because this the sherry stuff is so good. This is even better. I'm not joking. That's crazy. Yeah.